Okay. This is great. We're good. Good morning. I like that. Nice. Yes. I'm really happy to see you all here. You weathered the storm <laughs> and the snow. So, um, good morning. My name is Debbie Rose, and I'm the chair of the City Council's Committee on Waterfronts. And I'd really like to welcome you all here and welcome the administration, advocates, and members of the public to our hearing, which will focus on growing and developing the city's maritime water force. And this room is packed, so I see we have a lot of interest in that. The Port of New York and New Jersey is our region's gateway to international commerce and is the largest maritime port on the eastern seaboard and the third largest in the United States, following Los Angeles and Long Beach. The maritime industry supports almost 36,000 jobs, with $3.5 billion generated in economic activity for the city. Our harbor and surrounding waterfronts are responsible for the growth of our city into the economic, media, and cultural capital that it has become. Largely gone unmentioned in discussions related to how we can further diversify the city's economy and grow more jobs is the crucial role the maritime industry and its related um, areas have played in the city's economy. If we play our cards right, New York can be positioned to be a growing maritime capital for years to come. Central to that goal is the development of the city-based workforce so that they can be better trained to participate in these jobs. Improved workforce development strategies are crucial in order to maintain the city's maritime industry. To maintain the maritime industry as a major economic engine for the region, for the region. However, much of the work in the industry remains unknown to many residents seeking employment, partly due to the industry operating out of public view. The result is that many residents who may be qualified for or ready to train for maritime work are unable to avail themselves of jobs that pay high wages and are largely accessible to those without a college degree. The city is hoping to change the situation through a multi-sector approach that targets this issue with various workforce development, infrastructure spending, and educational initiatives aimed at, aimed at increasing the city's workforce participation in maritime-related jobs. Um, sorry. Maritime-related jobs continue to have the resources they need and that the city continue to develop new schools that focus on such career training. The redevelopment of how the city handles freight and distribution will also be crucial in growing our job base and even helping our environment. Currently, the city is overly reliant on trucks to distribute its freight and has the highest congestion costs of any major city. $16.9 billion in 2016, and the second highest average time spent in traffic. This will only become worse as the population continues to grow. Therefore, a major goal of the plan is to invest in more diverse modes of transportation by better integrating the city to the U.S. Marine Highway. The Marine Highway Program is led by the U.S. Department of Transportation with the goal of expanding the use of the nation's navigable waterways to relieve landslide congestion, landslide congestion, reduce air emissions, provide new transportation options, and generate increasing the efficiency of the surface transportation system by linking a network of ports over 29,000 nautical miles. Additionally, the city will launch Freight NYC, which is a multi-pronged strategy for determining how to more holistically manage and further develop citywide freight network. The first step in this process will be an EDC-led study that will develop recommendations for new investments to reactivate multimodal freight and grow jobs as a result. The hope is that the study will provide a blueprint, blueprint for investing in new facilities and technologies that will enable the city to meet its future freight needs more efficiently and sustainably. 
If the city is to truly maintain its status as the economic capital of the nation and work to diversify its economy, it has to maintain and strengthen its investment in the maritime industry. This will continue to be the engine of the city's economic growth, and I want to make sure that New Yorkers are well equipped to take part in that growth as members of the industry's workforce. And today, um, an unrelated topic, but a waterfront topic, however, we are also going to consider resolution number 478, which is sponsored by my colleague here, Helen Rosenthal. And this reso will honor the contributions of the members of Shore Walkers, Inc., a group which promotes and preserves New York City's shores and wetlands. The Shore Walkers have held an annual 32-mile walk around Manhattan's perimeter for over 30 years called the Great Saunter. The walk, which recently had its 30th anniversary, lasts for 12 hours, starting at the South Street Seaport and passes through 21 parks and promenades and over a dozen neighborhoods throughout the city and ends in the financial district. It helps to raise awareness about the Manhattan Waterfront Greenway and also promotes a healthy lifestyle and tourism in New York City. The resolution would recognize the first Saturday in May each year as the Great Saunter Day. And so we're going to hear um, from my colleague, Helen Rosenthal, about the Great Saunter and this resolution. And, um, and then we'll hear from um, a panel of saunterers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Rose. I want to start by thanking you for starting to address the more important issues of um, I mean, critically important issues of jobs and the waterfront. Um, I agree with you that co the congestion in the city has become overwhelming and to the extent our ports can relieve uh, some of that and we can uh, grow jobs as well, local, well, good paying jobs um, is incredibly important. Uh, uh, but now I'd like to start by expressing my sincere gratitude uh, to Council Member Rose for uh, allowing us to have this discussion about Resolution 478, which would declare the first Saturday of each May as Great Saunter Day here in New York City. A few years ago, a constituent of mine named Cy Adler approached me with the idea of having the City Council officially designate Great Saunter Day. Um, and as a, an act of terrific civic engagement, here we are talking about it today. For the uninitiated, the Great Saunter is an annual event put on by the nonprofit Shorewalkers. Every May for the last 35 years, Shorewalkers have led a 32-mile saunter around the entirety of Manhattan's shoreline. The walk, of course, is gorgeous, taking participants through some of the most iconic landmarks, parks, and neighborhoods in the world. But its civic purpose is greater than a mere walk in the park. It's a remarkable way to experience the intimate connection that our island city has with the bodies of water that surround it. This experience is part of the Shore Walkers' largest, larger work to safeguard our shorelines. Through the Great Saunter and their efforts during the rest of the year, Shore Walkers work to protect our parks, maintain the West Side Greenways, and advocate to connect the Greenway into a continuous path around the island of Manhattan, which when that happens, I won't be sauntering, but I will bike around the island. In recognition of this work, and more importantly, to demonstrate that the Council of the City of New York joins in recognition of the importance of our shoreline, I'm proud to support Resolution 478. And again, I want to thank Councilmember Rose for giving us this opportunity today. I look forward to hearing from Cy and others. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. We've been joined by Councilmember Deutsch. 
And um, I'd like to call the first panel. Um, we're going to address the great saunter first, and then we'll move on to the other topic. Um, so I'd like to ask Cy Adler from Shore Walkers, and David Haggerty, and Mark Diller from, um, Mark, David Haggerty is from Shore Walkers, and Mark Diller is here to speak in response to the Great Swan. Community Board 7. Oh, and Community, community board, board 7. Thank you. Do you want to swear them in? Or? No, okay. And once you um, take your seat, please identify yourself and the organization you represent. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my name is Cy Adler. And uh, I was born in Brooklyn, which is surrounded by water on three sides, and on a kitchen table, but that doesn't matter. And I went to Abraham Lincoln High School in Brooklyn and Brooklyn College. Okay, and I'd like to thank, first of all, all of you for giving us the opportunity to speak on behalf of this resolution dedicating the first Saturday in May as Great sort today in New York City. Okay, um, so besides as far as some of my other water activities, uh, I organized several corporations, and one of them was the Offshore Sea Development Corporation, which we, we develop certain products in aquaculture and in marine technology before we ran out of money and the market collapsed, but that's another thing. Okay. In um, 1982, I began to explore the waterfront of New York City. I was living in Manhattan at the time. And the waterfront of Manhattan is well over 1,000 miles, if you include the ocean and the Hudson River and parts of New Jersey, which we also explored. And I started a group called Shore Walkers. <clears throat> in 1984, the New York Times published uh, my op-ed piece, I had a suggestion. It was regarding making a walking trail along the Hudson River, which didn't have it. Hudson River, incidentally, is 315 miles long. Never actually did the whole thing. And, uh, and the, the, the article was for Huts, Hudsonophiles, a long, long path. And that, that sort of spurred the growth of shore walkers. In fact, we incorporated in 1984. And, uh, and we started to explore on foot all the different waterways in and around New York. Also, in 1984, a few curious uh, shore walkers and myself decided to see if we could actually walk around Manhattan Island. And for those of you who haven't done it, the Manhattan is about 13 miles long from the south to the north. And it's about 32 miles with, if you try to walk along the perimeter, along the coast. And, uh, and we did it, but at the first time, this was in 1984, it was a mess. Because of the container revolution, lots of ships, the shipping had died in Manhattan. It, it, as all of you here may know, it, most of it moved over to uh, Newark Bay and, and went along the Kilvan Cull. Now ships go through the Kilvan Cull instead of doing it. But what they left was a mess. It was a, a disaster in terms of trying to walk and do things along, along the coast. Then, well, we zigzagged, basically, and it was a mess, as I said. And the waterfront was very disturbed. But we walked the first time, and, uh, and then we kept walking. So once a year, at the beginning, the first Saturday in May, we organize a walk, shore walkers, organizes a walk that goes completely around Manhattan Island. And it is really a unique 
an amazing New York City walk. No, no, no place else in the world can do what we do. We don't have an island to begin with. So anyway, uh, and I wrote a book called Walking Manhattan's Rim, The Great Saunter, which also encouraged people to walk and to come to New York to see a wonderful waterfront. Uh, pre previous uh, to that book, I, I also wrote a book called Walking the Hudson, Not to Bear. The, that is, from the Battery to Bear Mountain. You can actually, we can, we, we figured out a way which you can actually do that. You have to go over the George Washington Bridge and get onto New Jersey, but one can walk from the south tip of Manhattan, where the battery is, all the way to Bear Mountain, mostly through parks. And uh, we, uh, we, as a matter of fact, we feel that that particular walk should be a national trail. There's a, there's a system of making certain trails national, and that's really civic and beautiful and uh, would like, you'd like help in doing that along those lines. All right, and uh, one of our members is Pete Seeger, who some of you may know. Wonderful civic person, as well as a musician. And uh, he, he suggested one day that we write a song about the great saunter, which we did. And I, I'm going to try, I, I, I'll recite it rather than sing it for you, but basically it tells, it's very short, and it tells the, what the, Mr. what the Adler, thing is about. Can you, um, can you sort of abbreviate um, your testimony so that yes, we so, can... Well, I don't have much more here. Okay, thank you. Anyway, but he said, the song goes, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know this town till you join the shore walkers. And they get you walking around. It's 32 miles around Manhattan's rim. 32 miles around Manhattan's rim. But you can join us for a few miles, and next year, come again. This, this song is on YouTube. I won't give you the next three verses. I'll look. But you can get it on YouTube. Anyway, as far as the shore walks go, uh, you, it was something you said we start at the South Street Seaport. We don't anymore because of Sandy. I'm sure you all know who Sandy was. Now we usually uh, start walking around 7 a.m. at the historic Francis Tavern, which is in downtown Manhattan. And uh, then we walk, and we walk for many reasons, and we go through over 20 waterfront parks along the Manhattan shore. 20 parks, as well as we see Grant's tomb and other amazing monuments in Manhattan. And um, we invite all of you to come along on the next great saunter. And our other walks, Joe Walkers has walks every week, and then we have some in Staten Island, as a matter of fact. I'd like to talk to you about that some oh, of the so time. Oh, so you know how to you know, okay. pull me into this. Anyway, so <laughs> once again, we thank you all for giving us the opportunity to dedicate the first Saturday in May as Great Saunter Day. And... Uh, have a good day. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I've never had anybody sing to me at a hearing. Um, I appreciate it. Um, next. Hi. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is David Hogarty, and I am the current president of Shorewalkers. Uh, I'd like to thank all the members of this committee uh, for having us speak here uh, today, especially uh, uh, Chairman Rose and uh, Council Member Rosenthal. For arranging this, uh, we really do appreciate it. I'd also like to thank um, Cy for uh, doing all the heavy lifting and not only founding the Saunter and uh, continue contributing to its success over the years, but for really doing the heavy lifting in helping us get here in front of this committee today. So thank you, Cy. Um, <clears throat> for more than 30 years. State uh, your name for the record. David Hokerty. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, for more than 30 years, the Great Sonner has not only brought the people of uh, the city together, but people from around the United States and the world to see uh, parts of Manhattan that they would never normally see. Um, as you described, the Saunter is a 32-mile hike around the island of Manhattan, and uh, it is a challenging one, but one that people come to year after year. And over the years, it has become, in my uh, estimation, one of New York's greatest traditions. Uh, for many New Yorkers, those who don't get to regularly cross uh, the harbor via bridge or ferry, um, it's easy to forget that New York is a city of water. Um, but the city's waterfronts are being rediscovered as one of this city's greatest civic assets. Um, at Shore Walkers, we don't see these waterways as barriers between boroughs, but this city's waterfronts as the connective tissue that binds our different communities together. Uh, along the course of the Great Saunter, participants pass through more than a dozen different neighborhoods. And for many, it is the first time that they are visiting a particular section of the city. Um, I know that <clears throat> New Yorkers like to consider themselves as very cosmopolitan and metropolitan, but I found that many of us can be somewhat parochial when it comes to our own particular uh, interests and neighborhoods. So this opportunity to really stretch their legs and their horizons is a great one for New Yorkers. Uh, one of the most common restraints or refrains I hear from participants in the Saunter is that I never realized that this building or house of worship or waterfront feature was here. I can't wait to go back at some other time to revisit it. Um, and that's how we kind of hook them in. We get them into one of our many other walks where we explore not just Manhattan's waterfront, but those of other boroughs. Um, the Great Saunter is really a journey of discovery. Uh, it's where New Yorkers come to discover parts of their own city and to discover each other. Striking up friendships as they fall in a step alongside each other over the course of 32 miles. Uh, as I said, it's become one of New York's greatest traditions. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak before you, and I, I hope that um, you'll all support this resolution uh, to make the first Saturday of May Great Saunter Day. It's always Great Saunter Day to us at Shore Walkers, but it's something we'd like to share even more with New York City. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And um, our last speaker, Mark Diller for the Great Santa. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. Uh, my name is Mark Diller, and like Council Member Rosenthal, I'm a former chair of Community Board 7. And thanks to Council Member Rosenthal, I'm still on it. Um, the, um, our district is 100% uh, surrounded um, uh, on the water side by public parks, and so we have a unique and blessed situation. Um, I'm here to lend my individual support. Unfortunately, the uh, hearing came up before I could bring a resolution before our board, so I'm here speaking in an individual capacity. My chair would want me to uh, highlight that. Um, in order to support uh, the recognition of Great Saunter Day, Community Board 7 has adopted core principles that we try to use to guide our thinking on a number of aspects and uh, resolutions that come before us. Among them are sustainability and inclusion. And I su suggest to you that recognizing Great Saunter Day would be consistent with both of those principles. Sustainability starts with education. And what better way to learn about our waterfront and its essential connection and the vulnerability of both our land and sea to climate change and other factors that affect us than to actually go out and experience it. The Great Saunter provides a unique opportunity to do so um, and that to do it firsthand. Um, and also, uh, I know that your topic today is about jobs, but what better way to inspire those who can look at the water and see a way to make a living, to make a, an essential connection with commerce, which is how, um, how this city became the financial capital of our country in the first place, that plus the vision of the, uh, of the canals. Um, and in terms of inclusion, we've already heard testimony about how shore walkers draw walkers from all walks of life, 
from all ages, all incomes, and heaven forbid, even all political parties. Um, we also get a chance to experience different parts of the city, and this is of the essence of inclusion. This inclusion starts with knowing somebody's name, and that is how uh, we at CB7 look at things and how I suggest that the council would do both our district and our island and our city credit by recognizing Great Saunter Day. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, uh, before you go, I just would, can someone tell me how many people participate in this, and is this event free? Mr. Adler, Mr. Adler, please speak into the mic. Sorry. Uh, we have a website called shorewalkers.org, and uh, frankly, you just go and you say you want to, and you sign up for the walk on online. And uh, what is my the question um, was just uh, if you could tell me how many people participate. Well, pardon? How many people participate in the Great Saunter? Well, recently over a thousand okay. per per walk, but we think it'll grow. And the interesting thing about this, compared to the marathon, we don't block any streets. At all. <laughs> well, we yeah, appreciate we go through, that. We go through parks. We don't we don't ask the city for any money, but we bring people to the city. Great. Um, and we thank you so much for that. Um, it's uh, not he can, only... He can tell you a little more about it, um, how to join. We, we have, you know, another hearing topic, so... I understand. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Is there, right. is there something that you, you'd just like to include before? Um, just uh, that um, our most recent uh, walk, we've, we had about 1,500 walkers, and... Um, uh, it's grown organically every year. So. That's wonderful. I want to thank you for bringing awareness to the waterfront. Um, I'm sure it's a great boon for tourism. Um, and, and I thank you. And we, um, we are going to move forward Resolution 478. I'm sure that um, there's not many people who would be opposed to it. So I thank you so much for being here today and um, look forward to making um, May the uh, Great Santa Day, right? Mm -hmm. The first Saturday of May, Great Santa Day. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. And um, we're going to call up the next panel. I, I want to thank uh, um, Councilmember Rosenthal for bringing this to our attention and uh, making sure that we recognize this effort. Um, and we're going to call the next panel, which is Max Taffet from NYEDC and Andrew Ginn from NYEDC. And I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Borelli also from Staten Island. Councilmember Rose, as they're coming yes. up, I really want to thank you for this. But happily, it's not Great Saunter Day in Manhattan, so it's Great Saunter Day. And perhaps so we need to be doing this in Staten <laughs> Island as well. I look thank forward you. to joining you on that <laughs> one. <laughs> thank you so much. We do have an effort to, um, to make our entire shoreline accessible. Um, we're working on the Greenway Trail oh, from the great. Verrazano Bridge to the Gothels Bridge. And um, our hope is to be able to be able to circumnavigate the oh, entire island. So this might be the impetus. So thank you so Good. much. Before we start, um, would you please raise your right hand? I do affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in this testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions. Yes? Yes. Thank you so much. And you know the drill. State your name and affiliation, and you can begin your testimony. I'm uh, Andrew Genn. I'm the Senior Vice President for Ports and Transportation at New York City Economic Development Corporation. 
uh, Max Taffet, uh, Vice President, Ports and Transportation at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Chair Rose and honorable committee members. My name is Max Taffet, Ports and Transportation at EDC. Uh, I'd like to provide you an overview of the maritime jobs in New York City and the regional economy and discuss the opportunities and careers as well as the essential city functions that come from what is arguably New York City's greatest asset, its harbor. Uh, I'll also review recent initiatives EDC and others in the harbor have created to increase awareness of opportunities in the industry and highlight key initiatives and investments underway to maintain and bolster maritime careers related to New York City's working waterfront. <clears throat> Uh, New York City Works, Freight NYC. In June 2017, Mayor Bill de Blasio released to New York Works a series of 25 initiatives to spur 100,000 jobs with good wages over the coming decades. Uh, the coming decade. The plan aims to combat economic inequality, grow the middle class, and adapt to quickly changing technology and global supply chains. Among these initiatives are creating industrial and manufacturing jobs. The city will add some 20,000 industrial and manufacturing jobs over the next 10 years, in part through an initiative called Freight NYC, to make comprehensive strategic investments to strengthen the city's logistics and distribution systems. This will provide more New Yorkers with access to good paying jobs. Today, trucks carry 91% of the city's goods into and out of New York City, with 80% of those vehicles entering from the west and traveling through key choke points like the George Washington Bridge and the Verrazano Bridge. Uh, this delays and increases costs for businesses throughout the five boroughs. New York City has the highest congestion prices, as previously mentioned by Councilwoman Rose, uh, and it costs businesses throughout the five boroughs. New York City's uh, congestion prices uh, are a major cost, up to $16.9 billion in 2016, and the second highest average time spent in traffic of any U.S. city. Freight NYC investments will create over 4,000 good-paying jobs across barging, docks, rail, and distribution, and support thousands more by providing the infrastructure needed for businesses around the city to grow. The city's investments in Freight NYC will reduce the burden of these costs on local businesses and allow them to continue to grow, hire, and thrive in New York City. New York City is at the geographic and logistical heart of the 31-county New York and New Jersey, Pennsylvania region, its port and supply chain industry. In 2016, the region's maritime facilities handled nearly 6.3 million 20-foot equivalent containers. These are referred to as TEUs. 663,000 imported and exported vehicles, 4.7 million tons of bulk cargo, 140,000 tons of bulk cargo, uh, break bulk cargo, and 260 cruise vessels across the region. More than 229,000 jobs relate directly to the maritime industry, with an additional 171,000 indirect and induced jobs by the maritime industry. Many of these approximately 400,000 jobs at the most basic level rely on the movement of ships beneath the Verrazano Bridge passing between the boroughs of Staten Island and Brooklyn. Monetarily in 2016, throughout the 31-county region, maritime activity generated $25.7 billion in personal income and $64.8 billion in business income. A bit of background on New York City's maritime industry. Waterways and maritime industry have played a critical role in the development of civilization, and New York City is no exception. The world's major cities were all constructed and developed on waterways and rivers. Sea travel and sea trade built the world we know today. Historically, all transportation modes have been associated with water to transport food, goods, and people. Water transport can be classified in the following primary categories, international and coastal freight in the form of dry and liquid, international and coastal passengers as cruise vessels, local passengers in the form of ferries, and local freight through barges for regional, uh, regional services and construction. Locally, beyond the dependence of the New York City consumer market on maritime-based supply chains, New York City residents benefit from the arrival of ocean-going vessels as the vessels require various maritime support services or secondary services, such as barge services to expand distribution, tug support services, including pilot support, and maintenance and repair services. 
A preponderance of these support firms are located along the shores of Staten Island and Brooklyn. The number and quality of local support service jobs required depends on the number of vessels, trade volume, trade growth, types of vessels, and other factors arriving in the port of New York and New Jersey. The local New York City uh, maritime support service sector is adept at offering the services required by international and domestic shipping and facilitates needed maintenance and docking operations that keep the harbor working. Without the New York City maritime support services and their skilled employees, maritime firms would look to other U.S. ports to import and export goods. Uh, specific numbers for New York City. As a subcategory of the 400,000 maritime jobs in the region, the New York City maritime industry supports 35,860 total jobs, approximately 9% of the total regional maritime jobs. Of these, 17,420 are direct jobs. These New York City jobs derive nearly $3.6 billion in personal income, which is 14% of the regional total personal income generated by the 31 county port region, and more than $8.4 billion in business income, roughly 13% of the total regional business income. In other words, New York City counties derive a disproportionate share of regional income per job compared to other counties in the 31 county region. The New York City maritime jobs are located across the harbor, ranging from Global Container Terminal New York at Staten Island's Halland Hook to Eastchester Creek in the northern Bronx, as well as everywhere on the water in between. Uh, maritime employment hubs. Though many New Yorkers may not realize it, there are significant maritime employment hubs on the waterfront throughout the city. New York City's Waterfront Revitalization Plan designates and maps these hubs under the title Significant Maritime Industrial Areas. Examples of these significant maritime employment locations are the Brooklyn and Manhattan Cruise Terminals, Erie and Atlantic Basins and the Red Hook Container Terminal in Red Hook, the Sunset Park Waterfront in Brooklyn, including the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, and Tugboat Alley on Staten Island's North Shore, where there exists one of the largest concentrations of tug and barge businesses on the East Coast of the United States. Beyond these direct on-water and water-adjacent job hubs, there's also a vast array of maritime and port-related logistics, distribution, finance, brokering, arbitrage, legal, and insurance jobs that are also concentrated in New York City. In fact, in 2016, uh, New York City saw increases in freight forwarding, distribution, and insurance industry workers related to port activities. This, not to mention the further maritime job activation undertaken through NYC Ferry, which in the last eight months brought service to 16 landings and will bring maritime activation to four additional locations in 2018. Today, some 260 mariners are employed by, by Hornblower New York, the operator of New York City Ferry. Global ship finance destination. Perhaps not surprisingly, given the city's innate waterbound and coastal nature, New York City ranks the number one maritime finance destination of all of the financial capital markets in the world. New York City is the largest and most liquid capital market when it comes to maritime shipping concerns. The local capital markets are the largest source of po public and private equity capital for shipping. This affords greater valuations to companies than other global exchanges. Public listings in New York City provide shipping firms ongoing access to financing at attractive rates for the course of the company's life. And New York City acts as the largest provider of public debt capital. Overall, the flexibility of New York City's capital markets to adapt financing products to emerging shipping trends has proven important to shipping companies and investors. This white-collar maritime sector in New York City is estimated to support approximately 7,000 jobs in the city, not to mention the millions of jobs uh, in global supply chain worldwide that New York City's capital market facilitates. Maritime education powerhouse. New York City's long history as a maritime education center is what feeds the pipeline of maritime jobs. Of the eight uh, total U.S. state and federal higher education institutions offering degrees uh, and U.S. Coast Guard approved courses. One, SUNY Maritime, is located in the Bronx, and the other, U.S. Merchant Mar Marine Academy, is located just over the Queens border in Nassau County at Kings Point. 
The academies receive funds from the U.S. Department of Transportation's uh, Maritime Administration, called, uh, summarized as MARAD, and each academy has a MARAD-issued training vessel. The SUNY Maritime Vessel, the U.S. training vessel Empire State the Sixth, uh, a 565-foot 1960s-era converted container ship, home ports at Fort Schuyler in the Bronx on the south side of the Throgs Neck uh, Peninsula. The Merchant Marine Academy's vessel, uh, the USTV King's Pointer, um, a 176-foot former NASA rocket recovery vessel, home ports across the western Long Island Sound. The Maritime Academies use the MARAD vessels for at-sea training and sh uh, shoreside laboratories. When necessary, MARAD activates the vessels for reasons of national importance, such as natural disasters or other emergencies. Most recently, in September of this year, the Empire State provided uh, emergency relief to San Juan, Puerto Rico and Key West, Florida. Following Hurricane Sandy, MARAD ships provided emergency support berthing at Homeport Pier uh, at Stapleton in Staten Island. Elsewhere in the harbor, other New York educational institutions also homeport vessels. Columbia University's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory Institute homeports the 210-foot research vessel Marcus uh, Langseth, and the Jamaica Bay Resiliency Institute, based at Brooklyn College, homeports the CUNY-1 a recently built 65-foot catamaran used for research in Jamaica Bay and western Long Island Sound. New York City Economic Development Corporation supports these academic institutions and others through the Doc NYC program, which provides berthing for an array of educational vessels. New York City Economic Development Corporation's Doc NYC coordinates berthing logistics, community access, insurance, and vessel tours to highlight maritime career opportunities. In the past year, a World War II Liberty ship, the SS John Brown, and the California Maritime Academy's Golden Bear visited Manhattan piers and provided public tours. Annually, EDC facilitates Fleet Week, um, which occurs each summer uh, where the city hosts uh, U.S. Navy uh, vessels coming into the harbor and uh, facilitates public access programs. In addition to the Maritime Academies and schools with vessels, Marine uh, education is offered at CUNY Kingsboro, Stevens Institute of Technology, the Webb Institute in Glen Cove, and the Siemens Church Institute in Newark, as well as other centers of education. Not to mention, uh, at Brooklyn Pier 12, the historic tanker, the Mary Whalen, which through uh, the not-for-profit Portside New York provides maritime education uh, in arts, preservation, resiliency, and workforce and harbor advocacy. But as important as the establishments of higher education and continuing uh, education institutions are to New York City's maritime industry, the secondary education institutions that inspire New York City residents and feed them into the higher education and workforce uh, are equally and especially important. <clears throat> New Yorkers are surrounded by water, but surprisingly few recognize it for the potential as a, the source of a lucrative career. New York City's high schools, such as the New York City Department of Education's Career and Technical Schools of Ralph McKee High School, the Harbor School on Governor Island, and the School of Global Commerce in East Harlem, are exposing students to opportunities and career pathways where students can make a career out of working in the New York and New Jersey Harbor. Um, to expand uh, high school students' understanding uh, and spark passions for opportunities in the harbor, New York City Economic Development Corporation hosted a high school maritime career awareness fair at the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal in October of 2017. The event connected more than 150 students from local high schools from around the city with two dozen plus organizations specializing in maritime careers, including colleges, labor unions, ferry and excursion boat operators, major trade associations, plus the Coast Guard, FDNY, and NYPD. Students from McKee High School, Transit Tech, and South Brooklyn Community High Schools in Brooklyn, School for Global Commerce, and the Harbor School mingled with maritime employers and saw equipment up close. For, uh, for many students, visiting the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal was their first exposure to the port industry. 
uh, representatives from the Maritime Association and Deputy Borough President uh, for Brooklyn, Diana Reynos, welcomed students and provided context, while the International Longshoremen's Association Local 1814 and the Teamsters Local 1812 demonstrated heavy marine terminal equipment in the cruise terminal parking lot. Uh, and Ports America, the stevedore for the Manhattan and Brooklyn cruise terminals, gave facility tours to students. In the weeks after the Maritime Career, Day, uh, Career Awareness Day, when the ILA 1814 recently had the opportunity to open up its membership list, this allowed direct outreach to, school, to schools. Similarly, UPS has held several career fairs with School for Global Commerce and Seafarers International Union has given recruitment presentations at Staten Island and Manhattan high schools. Leading up to the Maritime Career Awareness Fair, EDC provides ongoing curriculum development support at schools in Staten Island, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. In Staten Island, based on feedback from maritime firms, New York City Economic Development Corporation, the city's Department for Small Business Services, and Chair Rose worked with McKee High School to establish a hands-on electrical shop. At the School for Global Commerce, EDC facilitated direct connections with between career and technical education teachers and the maritime industry through site visits and curriculum review. And then at the most macro le micro level, EDC has provided job shadowing and internships for high school students in recent years. In the coming years, there are risks and there are opportunities for the region's port and maritime industry. A central risk is workforce. If the Port of New York and New Jersey does not continue to, inc to incubate a pipeline of qualified labor to fill the region's maritime supply chain and passenger transportation jobs, our local economy will suffer. As baby boomers age out of the workforce and the industry grows, there's an increase there is increasingly a need to fill skilled maritime jobs without continually reinforcing strong pipelines from educational institutions into the maritime workforce, New Yorkers risk missing out on good paying careers, and our region risks missing out on potential economic growth derived from the port industry. Investments, unprecedented physical investments in port infrastructure have been underway for the past decade to maintain the Port of New York and New Jersey's East Coast dominance in maritime jobs. International container ships are growing, expanding on average from lengths of 900 feet a few years ago to more than 1,100 feet today. This change allowing for increased numbers of shipping containers from 1,100 TEU to 1,400 TEU becoming the norm. The growth in length and container capacity also results, resulted in vessel growth in height and depth. To accommodate these greater dimensions, billions of dollars in federal, state, and city money have been invested. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey raised the roadway deck of the Bayonne Bridge to allow the new larger vessels to access container ports in Staten Island and Newark. Uh, while New York City Economic Development, was Economic Development Corporation was responsible for ensuring 50 foot uh, depths, drafts, ensuring 50 feet of vessel draft, dra draft beneath the Verrazano Bridge by replacing and deepening um, a water line between Brooklyn and Staten Island. Increasing draft above and below the ship shipping channel was required for the Port of New York and New Jersey to continue to thrive. Similarly to container ships, cruise ships are also growing. Investments in New York City's Brooklyn and Manhattan cruise terminals will occur to allow berthing of ever larger ships. The Brooklyn Cruise Terminal's new operator, Ports America, will contribute $15 million for additional capital improvements at the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal and $23.5 million at the Manhattan Cruise Terminal. These funds will be dedicated to improvements that increase the cruise terminal's capacity, connectivity, and efficiency, which will increase vessel calls and increase maritime employment. In conclusion, as New York sees more activity return to its harbor, we're seeing a growth in the number of maritime jobs. Big infrastructure moves are underway as the Port of New York and New Jersey adapts to the latest trends to global in global commerce. Supply chain and consumer trends are shifting with many new operations involving e-commerce, which has a higher employment per square foot than traditional supply chain distribution. EDC is dedicated to actively supporting the maritime industry and working with SBS's Workforce One centers to connect New Yorkers to jobs in this critical sector. In the coming weeks, you'll hear more about Freight NYC and how we will manage economic growth, congestion, and employment opportunities that relate to and come from our port. 
New York City Economic Development uh, New York City Economic Development's ultimate goal is to strengthen the city's economy and provide good jobs to our residents. We look forward to working with you, our regional partners, and industry leaders to grow the business in the port. Thanks for the attention, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you for um, your in-depth testimony. I, I think everyone sitting in this room um, can say that our waterways is very important, having multi-purpose uh, uses, and um, and then I just want to say that you know, when you know Andrew, it's it's been a pleasure working with with you. When uh, I first came into office, uh, took a tour of Staten Island's waterfront, and. Um, was amazed at the number of maritime industries that were thriving and was so crucial to um, the port, but also found out that there was um, a dearth. There was not the resources in terms of manpower um, and that there were jobs that were going unanswered um, on, on the waterfront, and I'm sure that Staten Island Waterfront wasn't the only one. And um, we put together, I thought, a wonderful partnership to bring um, the electrical um, sort of engineering courses to Marine, uh, to McKee High School, so that students on Staten Island who um, live on an island and had no skill set or no training to fill those jobs are, are now being given that opportunity. So um, I want to say thank you, you know, to EDC for recognizing and DOE and our other partners, our, our maritime industries, for recognizing how important that was to uh, Staten Island. And so um, I, I, being that, you know, this is such, Oh, an opportunity for job workforce development. Uh, I was wondering um, if there's any city agency, what if any, that tracks employment numbers and other related statistics for jobs and careers in, in the maritime related industries. Hmm. Well, let me start by uh, echoing what you said, uh, Chair Rose. You know, I, I think a lot of the effort uh, began on that fateful. Uh, trip on the NYPD launch on the Kilvan Cull with you. Mm -hmm. And I remember you talking directly to the uh, workers at the Moran uh, tugboat yard uh, on the North Shore and asking them where were they from. And I think uh, we didn't hear a Staten Islander. And we started the conversation that led to uh, the introduction to uh, Sharon Henry, the principal of uh, McKee high school, and uh, we were able then to start, uh, bring you to the uh, Maritime Association, the Tug and Barge Committee meetings, and uh, I'd say the people sitting behind me uh, are here because of that fateful day, and uh, we, we appreciate uh, so much your leadership on, in welcome. this area. Um, so in terms of keeping statistics, um, that's something that we're tracking very closely uh, at, uh, at EDC. The main source of information is the New York Shipping Association that does a, a survey of regional uh, jobs related to port activities. And uh, so the, the uh, statistics that Max cited in his uh, testimony uh, come from uh, that report. And um, we help supply some of the primary data, like for instance, employment at ferry companies or employment at the cruise terminals and that kind of thing. But, um, but that's the main source of good data right now on maritime uh, careers. Is this reflected in any of the um, New York City databases um, any of our agency databases? It pick, it's picked up Department of uh, Labor Statistics. statistics. Um, uh, there is uh, a, uh, an institute at CUNY that also tracks uh, labor in all different types of industries, and maritime is one of the ones that um, is specifically called out. And that's actually, be, it was that um, uh, work at CUNY that led to the creation of the, uh, the High School for Global Commerce in East Harlem. Is there a report that goes out at any point that 
discusses. Uh, um, well, the New York Shipping Association report is the main one uh, that that uh, is about every four years. I would say that in 2007, the last time EDC looked at this, we did a, um, a maritime support service uh, study. Uh, we hired um, um, uh, several professors from the SUNY Maritime College, and they did an in-depth survey of the industry, and we, we also used that as a resource as well. Um, so if there's not one place that we sort of store this data, hmm. um, how, how does New York City decide on how how to generate classes, studies, areas of hmm. interest, um, job generation? Hmm. Well, I think it's uh, the, the data sets are very informative, and I would go back to that maritime support service study where um, there were in-depth interviews done with the maritime businesses, and particularly in your district, and the discussion around you know skills gaps really began uh, in uh, that study and helped to inform the uh, some of the discussions we've had with McKee High School, uh, and as I said, you know related to that, I think uh, with the CUNY. Uh, analysis that they had done led to the uh, identification of the whole supply chain logistics field, which relates to maritime, but could also be air cargo, railroads, trucking. We saw that there was also a need for uh, more uh, people entering those fields as well. So um, some of the most highly demanded jobs are in the maritime field are? Oh, well, it, it runs the gamut, and that's what's great about the maritime industry. It's, it really is all-encompassing. So direct working on vessels as deckhands, as pilots, as captains, uh, but also along the shore as well, the, longshore in, uh, the Longshoremen's Association. Um, but the, you, you can also track towards you know, the other careers in the high finance as well and legal insurance, uh, freight brokerage, freight forwarding. A lot of the big institutions in the United States that oversee those industries are based in New York City and, uh, and spread out really across the whole city. So it's, uh, it, it really is a source of good jobs um, up and down you know, the, uh, the pay scales. So um, is there a perceived lack of visibility for maritime careers and educational opportunities um, among students and parents? And how can the city develop a broad as well as targeted public campaign mm -hmm. to improve that visibility? Yeah. I, one thing I wanted to point out, uh, Chair, is that you know it's such a cottage industry for New York. So we have um, the businesses in the maritime uh, industry. Some of them have been in New York Harbor for three centuries, going back to the mid 19th century. And so, and they remain owned by families, you know, from, you know, born and raised in New York City, which makes it kind of extraordinary. But it's, I would also say that one of the things that Cy Adler brought up in the previous panel is interesting is that there's been a perception, you know, if you um, walked around New, um, Manhattan Island in the 1980s, that the industry was all gone. And as you know very well, it's alive and well in your district. And making the connection to New Yorkers that there are jobs to be had in this industry is, I think, one of it. It's a generational thing, but it's a, uh, I think it's a challenge that we're very happy to take up. And I think that's why Max's testimony can, gives you a sense of all the effort you know, that EDC is doing with our partners behind, behind us here today. So um, how do we help the maritime industries um, get the word out, you know, <laughs> so that people, because I, I was astounded when we went on um, our mm. trip around the harbor that um, one, you know, there were so <laughs> few Staten yeah. Islanders working, yeah. but, um, but also that there was a lack of knowledge that these jobs existed mm -hmm. and that they were available and and what skill sets were required to mm -hmm. to get, have them so yeah. how do we is there a way is there a plan to get that type of information out so that it becomes more of a known entity 
That's, uh, you know, and, you know, I, I would just say that, um, you know, what Max and our team put together uh, with the Mar uh, Maritime Career Awareness Fair uh, a few months ago is one of those efforts to start, you know, gaining more awareness. Um, at the same time, you know, we work closely with the Tug and Barge Committee uh, and the Maritime Association, uh, the Working Harbor Committee, um, and with the schools to just uh, hold events. So there's a, you know, there's a Tug and Barge Day at Homeport every year, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, we're going to do the Marine uh, Maritime Career Awareness Fair every year. We'll move it around the city. So I think as we build that, and when Freight NYC is uh, also released, as Max was, uh, was saying, that that's, I think, also going to build additional awareness. I think you know, one last thing I'd say is that also, you know, the, um, the expansion of ferries in uh, New York City um, is also a helpful way to people realize, you know, there is this magnificent waterfront um, that we can, you know, we can enjoy and we can profit from. Yeah. And I'd, I'd add to that that on the recreational side, as more and more folks are coming out onto the water, organizations like the Waterfront Alliance are working with communities and paddling communities, there's an increasing awareness, an increasing level of comfort on the water, mm -hmm. and all of that is part of a broad effort that brings awareness to this can be uh, a career, this can be something that people really devote their lives to. Um, I think one of the initiatives uh, is, is called Career Propeller yes. Initiative. Would you like to explain the status of this program's um, development and how it aims to create a pipeline between New York City residents and work in the maritime industry? Sure. Uh, Career Propeller uh, is uh, an initiative that we've been uh, underway with, which is really about connecting the dots between the existing resources, um, kind of an overarching uh, uh, branding concept the, with a nifty name overlaying the Maritime Career Awareness Fair, um, as well as having ongoing discussions with uh, the various schools that are attending uh, our events and connecting them to the resources of Working Harbor Committee, Waterfront Alliance, as well as the uh, various industry partners. Um, with that, um, you also have um, the New York the um, Freight NYC study. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us the status of that? And have you hired a consultant to help develop the plan that you've already identified? And if so, what are the costs? And when do you expect it to be released? Sure. And uh, uh, Chair, Freight NYC is a comprehensive uh, look at freight systems into and out of uh, New York City and through New York City, looking at all modes and looking at helping to diversify modes of transportation, really favoring water transportation and railroads, uh, and to, to help relieve pressure on the city's highways, on congested highways. So on Staten Island, we'll certainly you know, be taking a very hard look at the uh, development of Howland Hook Marine Terminal. Uh, and uh, the associated rail uh, infrastructure that supports it, as well as uh, in, you know, new warehouse distribution centers uh, that you know, are coming into uh, the, the borough. Um, but then citywide, it's going to be looking at um, how do we geographically you know, diver diversify the way we handle freight so that it isn't all dependent on trucking you know, from New Jersey locations and try to spread you know, freight uh, into other systems to get it away from populations, to get it off of the highway where people are driving and more into corridors that are uh, exclusive for freight. Um, and then helping to develop the terminal points, whether they be in Staten Island or Brooklyn or the Bronx or Queens. Uh, and, uh, and even Manhattan, uh, so that freight can be feathered out and so that there isn't an unfair burden uh, on any community. But uh, since freight is ours, it's part of the economy, we think um, you know, taking a broad, long-range look and, uh, and um, uh, really planning for it in a thoughtful way. Um, the timing is really to uh, have it released uh, early next year. Uh, but uh, we still, you know, we do have a consultant. It's, uh, um, it's a team that's, uh, that involves um, VHB, Cambridge Systematics, uh, and HDR, as well as a few other uh, sub-consultants. Um, but it's really a, an EDC uh, production. Um, a very important thing in terms of freight has been 
a freight tunnel <laughs> that's been discussed for uh, several years. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about, you know, the status of that? You know, is that ever going to become a reality? Where are we with that? Is, is that really um, a part of a viable plan that we're looking at? Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, Cross Harbor uh, Freight Environmental Impact Statement, the Tier 2 Environmental Impact Statement, is being undertaken by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey uh, with Federal Highway Administration. Uh, and uh, we, we understand, you know, that that uh, initiative has been funded and will be uh, moving forward. Um, it is looking at the Cross Harbor Rail Freight Tunnel, a direct rail connection to the National Rail Freight Network. Uh, but it's also looking at other alternatives as well. And EDC will be, um, a, um, will be participating in that environmental impact statement. And certainly Freight NYC does recognize the tunnel as one element, but we're also looking at all of the infrastructure um, as well and w the types of projects that can be done even if the, if the tunnel doesn't advance for several years, there are still many things that the city can be doing to help improve freight transportation and also connect to jobs as well. You know, um, one of the, the issues um, that directly impacted the um, Howland Hook terminal mm -hmm. was um, the fact that they are very dependent on truck traffic. And um, when the Port Authority raised the tolls, it impacted that, mm -hmm. that traffic. Um, what are we doing to, to make connections so that the industry is not negatively impacted by um, the very thing that is supposed to be stimulating the economy? Mm -hmm. Uh, we have been working very closely with Global Container Terminal, uh, as you know, to help them um, uh, reduce the truck dependency by reactivation of the Staten Island Railroad. That was a, that was a big uh, step that helps, you know, connect them. That really is New York City's most modern connection to the National Rail Freight Network. The other thing that we've done more recently is uh, working with them on uh, allowing them to handle um, trucks that are equivalent to the trucks that the New Jersey Marine Terminals are using in terms of being able to handle over the Gothels Bridge um, up to 90,000 pounds uh, of weight on a truck, which is which makes the terminal more competitive and more attractive to shippers. But, you know, the whole suite of interventions, the channel deepening, the raising of the Bayonne Bridge, the lengthening of um, the main wharf at Howland Hook, and the activation of the railroad really are put Howland Hook at a good competitive place. And um, the, the state, as you know, has been helping out on the toll situation. And the good news is that um, business is up at the terminal. And uh, they've, um, they've seen the addition of a new sh uh, international shipping service. And they are, they are working very, uh, very uh, well with um, uh, identifying new business. So I think overall it's a stable situation. And we will continue to work closely to make sure that they continue to be successful. Have we um, provided them with the resources that they need to compete with Port Newark? Yep. And, um, and was there a loss of jobs as a result of the, the issues that we had, the intermodal issues that um, we had? There, 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 was, uh, there was a loss of jobs over the past uh, five years related to the um, diminution in business, which was partly a post-2008 phenomena and um, partly um, related to the increase in capacity in the New Jersey terminals. But they don't compete so much with New Jersey as we compete with New Jersey against other East Coast ports. And in, with the, in respect to that, I think they will do very well uh, over the long term. They have a sister facility in Bayonne, so the operating company is in a very good place. And we see the growth potential as being very high. And uh, just as a point of fact, uh, in the last month or so, uh, global 
container terminal and the ILA in Staten Island was able to add 55 additional new jobs at the Staten Island terminal. And um, when we look at um, the maritime um, businesses, and, and I'm just looking, I'm talking from my, um, my experience on Staten Island, many of the jobs are sort of like legacy jobs, and they're passed on from father to son, they're um, family related. Um, what are we doing to, in terms of educational programs and workforce training to, um, to make those jobs more representative or diverse or reflective of the communities where these um, industries are located? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and I think that the the thing to to point out is that you know the maritime businesses have many times come to us and said we need people with certain skills, whether it's the electrical installation or whether it's uh, carpentry, uh, whether it's um, uh, machinist welding, all of those things. And what we've what we found is there is that there has been historically a kind of a mismatch of you know. Um, skills training in those areas that we're seeking to address through these initiatives. So I think the, the, it was a big, big uh, deal to have that electrical shop open up at McKee because that directly reflected the conversations we've been having. Um, I think when we, um, you know, as Max had mentioned in his testimony, when the Seafarers International Union came to McKee, they saw, this is great. These are the kinds of shops that we need. These are the kinds of skills that we need for, uh, you know, to build a workforce. But, you know, one of the things that is a challenge is that there still is that sense, you know, that um, vocational education has a certain, you know, side to it that, um, um, that we hope will go away through better awareness and education, that if you have those skills, working with your hands, working, you know, outside, that you can make a good living. And I think we have to also, you know, instill that um, with, um, with, um, uh, with New York City residents. And there's, so there's that as well, yeah. So is there a focus to, um, to have, to open more schools, C CTE schools, with a maritime um, careers uh, focus? I think uh, you know, a lot of the schools in the career and tech uh, side ha are teaching skills that are readily kind of transferable. For instance, like Automotive High School teaches a lot about engines, and there's a lot of demand for people who can fix you know, it, engines you know, in the maritime field. Um, at the same time, I think would, um, you know, there are you know, opportunities even at a uh, place like McKee to be able to have much more of a one-to-one -one connection between what the businesses need and what is being taught. And so one effort for these schools is to make sure that there's a partnership board for each school, which I know is very strong at Harbor School. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and at global commerce, but uh, to have industry sort of regularly informing the schools, the existing schools of their curriculum needs, I think is very important. So, but we're we're not. Um, there's no concerted effort with DOE to open more CTE schools with a maritime hmm. um, focus. Um, and, and and to support that, you know, I'm talking for city yes, wide. I understand. Well, I think what we're what we've been doing is pushing in more with um, the department at uh, DOE that uh, oversees uh, CTE education, uh, so that if they're teaching something that's related but maybe not be completely on point, that that curriculum can be updated so that it reflects the needs of the maritime industry. Yeah. And um, are we working with um, the unions and all of the partners so that there's a, a ladder, a career ladder, um, internship programs, yes. uh, on-the-job training? Um, One of the best moments at the uh, Career uh, Awareness Fair was having uh, the Teamsters and the ILA uh, particularly the ILA brought some cool equipment out and uh, the kids got to, you know, sit on the equipment. Uh, some of them tried to operate the equipment, but they stopped them. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but that's, that's exactly what we want to do. And I think that forum allows us, is scalable 
uh, council member, you know, so that we can bring in more CTE programs uh, to have more of that. And I think the industry liked it. You know, we brought tugboats in. We brought um, NYPD vessels, fire department vessels, in addition to, you know, the, uh, the unions. Uh, uh, and uh, the kids got to talk to, you know, the actual practitioners, I guess. And I think, I think if we continue to do that, that's where that generational shift um, will occur. And um, just to shift it a little bit to, uh, I'm really glad to see that New York City recognized that um, uh, the value in ferries, having grown up in Staten Island and having once had maybe upwards of five ferries um, that were functional, um, I understand the value of using the waterways um, for transportation purposes. Um, and I'm glad to see that we're getting there. Uh, I hope you take this message back to um, the administration that we are still on Staten Island waiting for our ferry so that we will truly be a five borough ferry system. Um, but could you tell me what the current headcount um, of city paid staff working for New York Ferry is and um, what the headcount for Hornblower. Um. Yes, I have that. So um, there are, so through, you know, this was something we were very proud of. So Higher NYC, which is EDC's sort of uh, recruitment uh, arm, uh, was, uh, has brought on 262 people to uh, work on the citywide ferry system on NYC ferry so that's uh, so that's really good that's in one really in one year uh, uh, additional hires so we had 950 candidates uh, and 262 were hired through that process and what does what what's the staffing um, that was hired for hornblower the headcount uh, well, I think that's the, the 260. It's, it's total? Yeah, between, total. Working um, sort of so uh, on, on the water and, uh, and also uh, as part of, you know, behind the scenes, yeah. So are they considered um, New York City um, workers or are they employed, uh, privately employed by Hornblower? Oh, um, they are not, no, they're employed by Hornblower. They are. They are, yes. So um, there's not two separate workforces that all of, all of the hires are through Hornblower? Yes, that's correct. Um, okay. So are they union workers? Are they attached to a union? They are not as of now, but uh, Hornblower is open to it, open to unionization. Okay. Um, so we need to protect land zone for industrial waterfront and maritime uses on both public and private land and prevent speculation, which results in rising rents and displacement of people and jobs. In my district again, and, and this is a citywide hearing, this is not about Staten Island, but um, it just happens to have, I happen to have a question, uh, several about my district. An example is Miller's Launch, a multi-use maritime operator that services the, mar the marine construction industry, providing tugboats to transport and shift various barges, supports ships, ships of all types that require launch services. How can we ensure that facilities like these remain protected from other non-water dependent land uses? Uh, the IBZ program, the industrial business uh, uh, zones, uh, is an important uh, layer of land use protection. Uh, another important system of designation I mentioned in the testimony is the significant maritime industrial areas, which calls out specific areas across the city uh, as being of strategic uh, importance in the functioning of the harbor. Uh, and so any development along those waterfronts uh, must go through a coastal zone consistency uh, review that is performed by the Department of City Planning. Uh, 
uh, case of Miller's Launch, um, a incredibly important maritime business uh, that's providing essential harbor services from its present location. Mm -hmm. um, very much agree that protecting land uses going forward is, is a high priority. So are there any IBZs that are specifically designated for just maritime uses? The, I think the designation of the significant maritime and industrial area is one of the, one of the key protections for uh, the maritime zones, and uh, the North Shore is one of those SMIAs. Okay. Um, I think you've been um, very thorough, and I thank you for your testimony. And um, I, you might want to stay to hear you know, some of the testimony from the rest of our participants. They're um, quite amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Rose. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Chair Rose. Um, I'm going to call the next panel, and um, and when you, we're going to have to hold the testimony to two minutes. Uh, we have quite a few people who want to participate today. So, and we have to be out of the room by one o'clock. Reza Fakari Fakari from Kingsborough Community College. Dr. Carol Sonnenblit from CUNY. Um, McCauley? No. Oh, New York College of Technology. Valerie Westfall from CUNY. And Aaron Singh from New York Harbor School. Today. Thank you. Um, you can um, begin. Uh, state your name and your affiliation, and um, please honor our two minute clock, okay? Thank you. Today? There we go. Good morning, council members. My name is Valerie Westfall, and I am the University Director of Continuing Education and Workforce Programs at CUNY. I'll talk fast. We are pleased to be here today sharing our support for programs and resources to help train and place New York residents in jobs in the maritime industry. We are joined here today by two of our strong partner institutions, Kingsborough Community College and the New York City College of Technology. At CUNY, we help to train and educate over 250,000 students in our degree programs and another 270,000 students in continuing education and job training programs. We are proud to share recent research from Stanford University that shows that six CUNY schools are in the top 10 nationally of institutions that help to catapult individuals from the lowest to the middle income brackets. New York City's unique transportation assets, including our waterfronts, enable New Yorkers to gain access to good jobs in the maritime sector. The CUNY Labor Market Information Service, LMIS, is a trusted partner in helping to bring to life labor market trends, skill needs, and hiring practices of employers. And we believe that there is a growing opportunity to help prepare the maritime workforce through our colleges. Based on open maritime related positions that are posted online as of today, there are over 150 jobs ranging from project managers, engineers, carpenters, divers, and deckhands that are available to be filled. 
We would welcome the opportunity to work closely with many of these employers to understand their needs and match open positions to our students and alumni. Where training does not exist to meet the needs of employers, we have a robust set of partners who are innovative and nimble and can create new training programs for industry partners. As both the mayor and governor focus on sustainability goals and increasing our focus and utilization of renewable energy resources, we want to make sure we are prepared for new jobs in the maritime sector, including offshore wind farm construction, installation, and maintenance. A report published by the Workforce Development Institute earlier this year entitled New York State and the Jobs of Offshore Wind Energy articulates a need for maritime trained workers for complex projects that require a diverse, highly skilled, and well-trained workforce. WDI's research also identified an estimated 74 occupations that perform across the phases of an offshore wind power plant. Most of these occupations are well established in New York's economy. They include scientists, engineers, lawyers, and sales representatives, all needed during the development phase. Electricians, iron workers, and welders construct wind, forms, wind farms and support the operations phase. Training and research professionals work across Begin all phases of the project. I'm sorry? Can you finish? Oh, she finished, sure. Thank you. So the, the, the wind industry is growing at a rapid pace. The first project uh, was completed and con construction began um, off the coast of Rhode Island in 2016. There are several more in the planning stage. Um, it's a uh, complicated kind of structure with foundations in the seabed, turb turbines with a hub height of 100 meters. Um, states along the East Coast from Massachusetts to Maryland are actively moving similar projects forward in the hopes of capturing workforce and supply chains that they would bring. Um, I'll end there. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rose. My name is Reza Fakhari. I'm Vice President for Workforce Development at Kingsborough Community College. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify before you today. As the CUNY College by the Sea, Kingsborough is deeply committed to environmental stewardship and sustainable practices. We house an engaging organic urban farm on our campus and host a three-day annual Echo Festival currently in its 11th year. Kingsborough is also the only college in New York City to offer a degree program in maritime technology. Kingsborough has recently undertaken an ambitious strategic initiative to deeply engage with local industry and businesses to meet their workforce development needs and prepare the borough's residents for growing job opportunities in Brooklyn and the greater city. These alliances have included establishing the Customer Experience Management Academy with National Grid as the anchor partner as well as 10 other leading partners, including Con Edison, Citibank, and TD Bank, in addition to establishing the Natural Gas Technician Certificate Program with National Grid. We will, we will soon launch our satellite presence in Liberty View Industrial Plaza in Sunset Park next to South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. This satellite presence will place us in close proximity of industry city Brooklyn Army Terminal and Brooklyn Navy Yard, enabling us to better assess and address the emerging workforce needs of local employers, including those of the maritime industry workforce. Our maritime technology degree program in the Department of Tourism and Hospitality at Kingsborough has provided the students the opportunity to earn an associate in applied science degree in maritime technology, a U.S. Coast Guard approved program. Over 30 years, it has served nearly 1,800 students who have earned 225 days of sea time applicable toward a captain's license or U.S. Merchant Marines officer's license. As their training is 50% hands-on, graduates are highly sought after by both public and private employers and are typically employed as captains. In collaboration with workforce development, the Maritime Technology Program developed an affordable 12-day deckhand training program in 2016 that provided participants with certifications needed to apply for deckhand position with some of the New York City's leading ferry and ex excursion fleet service companies. The Maritime Technology Program has an active advisory panel whose members represent employers across the range of maritime industries.
Kingsborough Community College and New York City College of Technology have a long-standing history of collaboration. We are excited to partner further under CUNY central support, combining and complementing our distinct strengths to meet the workforce training needs of the New York City maritime industry, including the needs of the emerging wind industry. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Um, you know, even speed reading two minutes hasn't been good enough for you, so we're going to extend it to three minutes, and we'll give you an opportunity just to say, to finish if you were cut off prematurely. Oh, okay. Professor Sonnenberg. Good morning, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. My name is Carol Sonnenblick, I'm the Dean of the Division of Continuing Education and Workforce Development at New York City College of Technology, the designated College of Technology at the City University of New York. Um, we emphasize sustainability and respect for the environment and have fostered growth in programs that reflect the meteoric advances in the emerging technologies that are shaping industries for a greener future. This is most evident in the Division of Continuing Education where the expertise of faculty and industry partners come together to prepare students to meet the expectations of a 21st century workforce. Approximately 10,000 students enroll in continuing education courses that match the needs of new job seekers, career changers, incumbent workers, professionals in need of license renewal, and those interested in emerging tech, tech sector employment. Sorry. In recent years, the division has introduced new courses in green roofs, installation, residential and commercial photovoltaic design and installation, and commercial and residential wind power uh, installation. The division's state-of-the-art on-site labs and our outdoor facility lab on historic Wallabout Bay in the Brooklyn Navy Yard mirror the realities of construction, calculation of energy production, and the benefits of sustainable practices. City Tech's proven ability to customize curricula to prepare a technically proficient workforce is a matter of record. Mayoral agencies, community-based organizations, major construction and corporate entities have contracted sector and organizational specific training. We have the experience, capacity, and commitment to train a workforce in the skill sets and mindsets to assemble turbines that will harness wind energy to create clean and cost-effective electricity. The advanced expertise of faculty in the School of Technology and Design and forward-thinking industry-specific course development in the Division of Continuing Ed will enable City Tech to meet the technical requirements to train te technology savvy professional wind turbine technicians for offshore installations. To summarize, uh, City Tech brings unique strengths in the CUNY partnership for maritime training, which include the Academy for Occupational and Construction Safety, the New York City host for Region 2 Atlantic OSHA Training Center, which trains over 5,000 construction workers each year in over 90 safety certifications. We offer preparation for the FDNY Certificates of Fitness in such areas as fire safety and others, technical courses in welding, electricity, operating systems of HVAC, blueprint and schematics reading, carpentry, and construction, all features hands-on activities. We have a history of ongoing commitment to principles of sustainability with continuing course development and just recently hosted 120 participants in a seminar for solar PV storage and the microgrid. Strong ties to industry innovators and researchers keep us abreast of advances in energy technologies. KBCC and City Tech have an, a long-standing history of collaborative projects, which include a multi-year, multi-million dollar U.S. DOL grant and advanced manufacturing, among other, other technical trainings. Shared curricula across both campuses include a two-campus partnership delivering hemodialysis training for nurses and technicians and a future partnership of shared training for medical assistants. City Tech's ability to deliver training off-site. We have a learning lab at the Navy Yard, 
deliver courses at Industry City, Far Rockaway Local Development Corporation, and New York City Department of Buildings, major and smaller construction companies, to name a few. City Tech's experience and ability to customize programs to meet industry requests. Can you which, wrap up? Yep. Okay. Which include an associate degree in telecommunications for Verizon employees, courses in electrical engineering for MTA workers, Local 100, uh, courses for SEIU 1199, facilities operations for Local 670, and work with other unions. Safety training, with the exception of scaffolding, which requires a fixed and permanent site, can be delivered in corporate settings at a client's request. City Tech and KBCC have a long and positive history of working side by side to create programs that meet the projected learning uh, objectives of customized, successfully delivered programs that reinforce the importance of a skilled workforce. And our major strength is that we are able to customize and create programs to meet specific employer demands. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Aaron Singh. I'm the Vessel Operations teacher at the New York Harbor School. Ooh, let me get that over here. <laughs> uh, Aaron Singh, the Vessel Operations teacher at the New York Harbor School and Waterfront Director. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Rose and Chairman of the uh, Waterfront Committee for hosting this hearing, which is near and dear to our core values at the New York Harbor School. And I do want to show you guys our maritime workforce. They're right over here. Uh, we have over eight graduates that are present at this uh, hearing. Uh, they're captains working on NYC Ferry. They're working at Hornblower. They're working at Miller's Launch. They're working at Brooklyn Bridge Park. These, this is our maritime workforce, and we're fortunate at Harbor School to actually have many mariners come out of this program. Uh, the future... The future is looking right now in the webcast, in the camera right now. So we have our classes here who are looking at these hearings, and now they're look, tuning in, I'm sure. But uh, I told them I was coming out here to talk a little bit about our programs, and I mentioned that the city's interested in investing in our career and workforce, and they quickly had suggestions, so I gave them a homework assignment. And so right now, they're working on their homework assignment. They'll have that submitted, and we'll go ahead and email that to you. So the New York Harbor School is a maritime career and technical education high school preparing students for maritime trades through the Billion Oyster Project and other job training initiatives. Originally opening up in Bushwick, Brooklyn in 2003, and since moving to Governor's Island in 2010, we were not the first maritime trade school in New York City, believe it or not. The first one was the John W. Brown, an historic World War II Liberty ship that was home to food and maritime. How many people remember that? There we go. Um, it was at the foot of Houston Street, uh, Pier 40, and hundreds of students learned the trades of deck, engine, and stewards department. We're not recreating the wheel here at Harvard School. With strong education partners at Kingsborough Community College, which I also went to, uh, SUNY Maritime, and Kings Point, our students benefit with hands-on, real-world program connections. Our education partners are joined by maritime industry companies. Some of them are represented here with Miller's Launch, South Street Seaport Museum, and did I miss anything? Okay, <laughs> well, we, we, there's lots of stakeholders inside the harbor here that support our programs. We have over 100% internship placement with our students, 100%, with 50% retaining connections with these companies for paid positions after they graduate harbor school. Our industry partners offer job shadowing, guest speakers, and the ever important site visits. If they can't see it, how can they dream it? That's an important quote. I didn't make that up. Uh, Elijah Cummings, a uh, congressman that is proactive in the waterfront um, issues, you know, and believe it or not, you know, most New Yorkers aren't going into industry. We've been talking about that. And so our goal at the school is to bring them to those sites and uh, have those real world connections. Kingsborough uh, Community College offers our students through the College Now program and the marine technology classes continued support, and they also offer us validation. So we have a career and tech ed program that's state certified, and it's through their uh, articulation agreement this is, happens. SUNY Maritime runs a wonderful STEM high school camp. Student interacts with um, our waterfront department, and we take the U.S. Coast Guard launch operate license there every June. Just to wrap up here, the need to grow the city's support for training programs is there. This shouldn't be funded primarily by private donations, which is the case with the New York Harbor School. This should be city pushed. And with the city must invest in a training center, vessels, pathways to enter the job market. The investment in the New York City ferry system requires this investment. They already did that. 
getting the uh, vessels out there and you know, the need for transportation hub, now we actually have to fund the training behind that. The need is also echoed by the commercial passenger operators and the tug and barge community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for um, being on the front line of, of providing the educational, the education and the skills that um, people need to actually work in, this, in these various industries. Um, so um, I don't want to call you Aaron. Mr. Singh. Mr. <laughs> Singh. Um, how many of your students graduate and go right into, um, well, first, how many graduate? And then how many go into a job right after graduation? So we've been getting the, the, the questions a lot as far as where our students are going. So to understand Harvard School, we have eight current tech ed programs. I teach the maritime program, which is called Vessel Operations. So within our cohort, we do have numbers as far as where our students are. Mm -hmm. um, so class of 2016, 58% are currently in the maritime industry, meaning that they graduate from the school, they're either attending Kingsborough, SUNY Maritime, or currently employed. Uh, 2015, 80%. That's a huge number. 80% are currently in the maritime industry, followed by 62% in 2014 and 2013, 57%. So Harvard School just in the last five years have, <laughs> has a state certified program. So we're tracking these numbers now. And uh, just to understand a little bit about Harvard School, because we have eight programs, they're pretty unique. And so those, those numbers vary on what students are going in those career pathways. But uh, there's definitely a need on the maritime side. We get contacted all the time, and uh, operators here, commercial operators, private operators, and there's not enough of us to be able to get these programs and these students geared towards that. And just one last thing, we, we are public high school, so we take anybody and everybody. Just understand that. So our big initiative run through the Billion Oyster Project is to do middle school outreach to get to these students early so they start thinking about this as being a possibility and we're trying to do that because located on Governor's Island our community is Lower Manhattan and so through the Billion Oyster Project they funded initiatives in over 40 schools in Staten Island in all five boroughs and so these initiatives happen in Title I schools because again if they can't see it how can they dream it? Um, so uh, that's a great great place to, um, to segue. Outreach you, um, your school does outreach to, um, to middle schools, or is it DOE um, overall um, when they're recruiting yeah. for high school? Well, I'm a public school teacher, so I, the work that I do obviously is through the DOE, but the primary source of uh, being able to make these initiatives happen is through the Billion Oyster Project. They're a not-for-profit that supports a lot of these initiatives. And so they t they, they, they've taken on the challenge of being able to get to these Title I schools. So it's privately funded, and so there's a lot of fundraising that happens which is not sustainable. Ah. So there are no DOE dollars that goes into There's this There's zero program. DOE dollars that happen. So just so you understand, career and tech ed programs can vary, right? We can talk about plumbing, carpentry, electrical. Right. The maritime industry, imagine a career and tech ed program that requires boats, infrastructure, welding, all of those trades here, licensed U.S. Coast Guard captains. So there's no way we would be able to do our programs based on the funds that are given for career and tech ed programs. So that's why we need the Billy Noyster Project to be able to fund this. It's not sustainable. And so what we're hoping for is the city, and this is amazing that EDC is coming out and everybody's here is talking about this, to take this on as, hey, this is a need. And we already know that the city has a history with funding these programs through the John W. Brown. So the goal right now is to start taking a look at that and actually investing in uh, middle schools and high schools. And one last thing, the DOE, the chancellor, has agreed to start up two middle schools that are harbor related. Right now, SCA is currently finding locations in Staten Island, which I think they've narrowed it down, and I'm sure you're aware of, mm -hmm. and currently in Red Hook. And so we're hoping that Harvard School could be a catalyst with that. Um, and so we're, we're looking to grow. So um, it sounds to me like um, we should be hearing um, a budget request from DOE in terms of CTE and specifically maybe maritime um, tech? I would agree. Yeah, I would agree, I, I think so. Um, so stakeholders are very important 
and, and partners are very important. And so CUNY, you are providing um, services to our CTE schools or are you only, uh, like the college has College Now right. where it's a bridge program between the high school and the college. Do you have a similar program um, to College Now with um, the Harbor School? We do have College Now. We also have a Department of CTE Education, which I didn't mention for uh, individuals interested in career and technical education. Um, we have outreach. The uh, City Tech has two high schools that we run, one City Poly and one P Tech. Um, one is an IBM um, supported school and the other is run completely through the Department of Construction, Architecture and Environmental Control Technology at City Tech. So we're very much steeped in the education, outreach to younger people, middle school students, um, specialized programs for middle schools, offering them transition into high schools. Our high schools are open to everyone and are very um, STEM oriented. Uh, so that we reach out to all populations trying to create a career path from middle school to high school into college and then certainly with forward thinking to employment. Thank you. Chair Rose, as uh, Mr. Singh mentioned, we do have a collaboration with uh, New York Harbor High School. We have had it for uh, uh, a few years and our maritime technology program offers courses on their campus and these courses have included introduction to maritime technology and coastal piloting and seamanship and as he mentioned a good number of the graduates of Harbor transfer um, to our maritime technology program and this is through our pioneering college now program. Thank you and Kingsborough you offer oceanography and marine biology and things of that nature also, right? We offer those courses. We don't have a distinct pro a program, but we do have those courses, including courses in environmental studies. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. And um, I'll be talking with you, Mr. Singh, about um, Harbor School and um, the Billion Oyster Project and budget allocations. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel is Roland Lewis from the Water, Waterfront Alliance, um, Edward Kelly, Maritime Association of Ports of New York and New Jersey, Eric Johansson, Tug and Barge Committee, and Stephen Calavetto, the Grant Association CTE Industry. Okay. All right. I'm sure he knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the usual uh, age before beauty. Oh, there we go. Okay, so you know, um, introduce yourselves and tell us your affiliation, and you may begin. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Stephen Calavito. I work with Grant Associates as a business relationship manager in relation to the CTE. Could you pull your mic closer? Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Calavito. I'm a business relationship manager as it relates to a program called the CTE Industry Scholars Program. Okay. And this program involves students that are enrolled in career and technical education schools that have shown an interest or a passion for careers in uh, several different fields, one of them being transportation, logistics, maritime. Okay. All right, you can testify. Would you like to testify? Now, my, my uh, purpose here today is just to brief you on this program and uh, speak to you a little bit about it and the success we've had so far with partners like the Harbor School uh, and employers that Mr. Singh has already mentioned, such as um, the Billion Oyster Project, 
Miller's Launch, as well as um, South Street Seaport Museum. Uh, over the summer uh, and the spring of 2017, uh, we hosted, uh, employers hosted over about over 500 interns that were enrolled in various CTE industry tracks uh, with over 200 employers and we, uh, the, res the results yielded a 98% completion rate in the summer, a 96% jo um, job readiness rate at the entry level, and a 90% re-engagement uh, re request rate from employers. So the program's been highly successful. Uh, we've received many uh, part-time job offers for our students and various testimonials from employers. And uh, you know, our goal is to continue to develop business relationships as our program scales into 2018 and hopefully garner support of the Waterfront Committee Council uh, through future discussions in 2018. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rose. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, Waterborne transportation is, has been, and always will be an essential and unique asset to the city of New York. This is true since before human inhabitation, and it gets increasingly important with congestion, urban growth, and the requirement to protect our environment. Uh, this impacts every citizen that's within our area, in fact, the entire nation since the Port of New York is also a global gateway and of global importance. It impacts everyone's lives from the imports that they wear, their clothing, their shoes, the exports that are sent out as a result of our jobs in stimulating our economy, as well as cleaning the uh, environment, moving our refuse, etc. The problem is we've gotten so good at this that people don't even know we do it anymore. Uh, as We've, I won't repeat the statistics, but as Mr. Taffet of EDC had said, there are well over 200,000 direct maritime jobs in this area. And the important thing about this is that very few people realize the range, the depth, and breadth of those jobs that are available in this industry. This industry is rather unique in offering such a broad gamut of job opportunities, the vast majority of which are very well paying and which provide benefits that are family sustaining. Anything that you want to do, we have a job for you. Whether you want to work outdoors with your hands, whether you want to get advanced degrees and become an admiralty attorney, a ship designer, a marine engineer, or if you want to be on the water, if you want shift work, if you want to work certain times, if you want to work indoors, if you want to work in an international environment, if you want to have a very rewarding job that can afford you travel across the world, all of this is in the maritime industry, and the unfortunate thing is that very few people in New York City know that anymore. We have, as we heard with some people talking, there are CTE and trade schools for hematology, for nursing, for this, that, everything else. We do not, and the city of New York has not, taken the opportunity to make the opportunities in this maritime industry known and available. Now, the problem here is that this is an industry that requires training and or certification for being accepted into the workforce. This industry requires transportation worker identification credentials, Coast Guard licensing, ratings, trainings. It requires skill sets. People that are going to get into our maintenance and repair aspects need to know how to weld, how to work machine shops. Marine electrical engineering is very different than landside economic uh, electrical engineering. Certainly, if you're standing in a puddle of water, you want to be a little bit different <laughs> and special about handling large-scale so. electric. Our success at McKee, which you were so very important with, which EDC helped to stimulate, was very important in getting this working. It also created internship opportunities for people to see. This industry, like any industry, has a constant need to bring in new people. We need people to help us with that. We need awareness. As we had said, there are very few specific schools at a high school level leading toward this. The Harbor School has been a sterling example of this with industry support, with good back and forth, industry advisor panels. The Urban Assembly School has done the same thing. The city needs to put money into this 
to not only support those schools and increase their output so that we can hire them, but it also needs to put money through the DOE system so that students and people are aware of the opportunities in this industry so that they can decide where to go to school and what training they will get. Industry is willing, ready, and able to engage. We have proven that with our involvement in Maria, uh, Maritime Career Awareness Days, which again EDC had sponsored and worked with. We have our, in our port, we have our CPP workforce development programs. We have had internships. We offer job opportunities. We want to hire qualified people with proper training and credentials, and we urge the city to move toward that. You had mentioned earlier, what can the city do to also help? We have got to both restore and enhance the habitat in New York City for maritime companies to thrive. How will that be done? And I know I'm already over my three minutes. We need to work toward proper zoning, including the SMIAs, the significant maritime in, uh, industrial areas, so that they're better protected than they are. We need to work with our tax scheme. We need to get a rational New York State dredging program in place, and we need to address a myriad of regulations that do not exist in our next door neighbor, New Jersey. And regrettably, many of these industries on the water can float across that river rather easily. The good news is we have a very strong, particularly maritime support industry in this city. And many of those companies, as has been mentioned, are well over 150 years old in their incorporation, are run by families, and the city in particular, Staten Island and Brooklyn, still have and maintain a very strong traditional maritime base, offering good paying jobs. But again, we offer everything from marine money, when New York is the capital center of maritime financing for the globe, to admiralty attorneys, to design firms, and the majority of the North American maritime companies are headquartered in or right nearby to this city. We have tremendous opportunity. If New York City wants these jobs, they have to help to prepare their citizens to step up to get the training and to get the certifications they need so that the industry is not forced to hire from other places. When you stop and you hear people, I'm from Massachusetts, I'm from here, right. that's because that's where they receive their education, training, or certifications. We want to hire locally. We're trying to hire locally. And one very thing that I can never let anything go by and mention are with the Long Shore, the Long ILA, our collective bargaining agreement calls for a minimum of 51% of all new hires to be military veterans, and we're very proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Councilman, uh, Councilmember Rose. Uh, uh, I'm Eric Johansson. I'm the D executive director of the Tug and Barge Committee and a professor at the Maritime College uh, right here in the Bronx. Uh, this is America's oldest maritime college, uh, founded in 1874, and the largest, nearly 2,000 uh, uh, students at this time. I'm a third-generation mariner. I've been working actively in the Port of New York uh, for now over 40 years, hard to believe. Um, and I represent the Tug and Barge Committee, which consists of 31 Tug and Barge operators and four shipyards right here in the Port of New York. We're the ones who are hiring all of these you know, employees. So we have a big stake in what's going on here, and we're hoping that uh, this works out. Uh, and New York City is blessed to have uh, not only the oldest and largest maritime college in the United States, Maritime College, but also the three high schools uh, that are focused on the maritime industry. A competitive port requires a skilled workforce to maximize regional job. And since our founding in 2007, the Tug and Barge Committee has been leading advocate for maritime education with longstanding relationships with McKee uh, Career and Technical High School in Staten Island, the New York Harbor School in Governor's Island. Matter of fact, we've been with them since Bushwick, Brooklyn, um, and then Maritime College in the Bronx as well, and recently have begun working with the Global School of Commerce in East Harlem. Skilled maritime industry workers support a complex and expanding port system, and that will play a significant role as higher cargo volume uh, volumes uh, are, are to meet the demand of the projected increased population growth in a city and a region. Regional and discretionary cargo growth increasingly will look to water transportation on marine highways to maximize trade and commerce while minimizing environmental impacts by relieving congestion on overworked, truck-clogged highways. Our waterways have nearly unlimited capacity 
and for centuries have served a vital conduct for the commerce of the city's economy. The Empire State and financial industry were built on the backbone of our harbor. With so much at stake, uh, ensuring that New Yorkers possess the requisite skills to fill jobs at all entry levels in the maritime industry, we realize the Tug and Barge Committee supports the following initiatives. Uh, we want you to support maritime activity and skill training with the New York Harbor School, who has done an excellent job uh, with training in seamanship for deck and engine operations and preparing students also to go to maritime colleges. With McKee Vocational School on Staten Island, uh, for the shipyard workers, we've done a good job with electrical engineering, as Mr. Kelly has said, marine electrical engineering. We also need to increase uh, training in welding, machinists, both outside and inside, and maintenance. The School of Global Commerce on Manhattan, or East Harlem, uh, we need those people to provide the office workers for supply chain, purchasing, and human resource management. Maritime College in the Bronx is already training on a graduate and undergraduate level uh, in regard to uh, providing uh, licenses for domestic and international officers, supply chain management, cybersecurity, port security, trade and logistics, port and terminal operations, marine insurance, marine finance, and blockchain technology, uh, and, and more, you know, naval architecture and, what, uh, and so forth. Uh, we also ask that you reactivate the uh, Waterfront Management Advisory Board to actively promote the New York Walking Waterfront supported by skilled maritime workers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Rose. Uh, Roland Lewis, <laughs> Waterfront Alliance. Um, I, I'd like to, uh, our full written testimony is there for you to read, but uh, I, there's three or four themes that I'd like to uh, uh, um, explore and, and, and highlight uh, that I've heard this morning. Uh, what, first, I think most importantly, uh, a lot of questions you are giving uh, to the city uh, about awareness and uh, studies. Uh, we don't have a good study. Uh, we, uh, and I, I have great respect and appreciation for the New York Shipping Association's uh, um, analysis of 400,000 jobs in the area. It's huge. But we haven't looked at our maritime industry since 2007, as EDC uh, said before, and we don't look expansively. Think about the billions of dollars that are going from Superstorm Sandy that are going to rebuild uh, or build new breakwaters and, and oyster reefs in southern Staten Island and other. Those marine uh, engineer jobs, those uh, uh, marine biologist jobs, they're not coming to New Yorkers. They're, they're big engineering firms that are recruiting from around the world. They should be recruiting from the five boroughs of New York. So thinking expansively about all the different waterfront type jobs that are out there and having the city of New York look at its own, fund its own study and getting that done to create awareness. Uh, the points made about the, the, um, our, the recreational use of the harbor, increasing the ferry use of the harbor, it's creating awareness. The amazing job fair that, that the city of New York did uh, out at the, is, is creating awareness. But we need to uh, tell the greater population about what's out there, what it is, and how important it is in real dollars to, to the economy. Second thing is, is, is retention. Um, I won't, uh, Ed made many of the great points about what needs to be done to uh, 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 make sure that maritime industry stays here, but let, let's specifically talk about uh, the Red Hook Terminal. Will that be there? Will, will those jobs stay, stay there? The SBMT, the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, why hasn't the city done a lease and moved forward with that, with that uh, area? You brought up Miller's Launch uh, on, on Northern South Island. Retaining the infrastructure and improving the infrastructure that's necessary for all kinds of maritime jobs, whether they be shipping, marinas, education. How do you get? How do the the, the, the students at the at the Harbor School and other schools get down to the water to plant oysters or whatever they're going to do? We need to create infrastructure at our water's edge that promotes the economy, promotes jobs, and and ret and certainly retain what we have already. And. Uh, I think most importantly, a, a theme I hear is the theme of growth. Um, you know, uh, I, you, you, you heard earlier about uh, wind farms. Uh, this is back to SBMT. Uh, we need uh, New York can and should be the uh, um, the mecca for uh, wind farm production. We're building a bloody city out in the ocean in the near future, in the not too distant future. Uh, we should be the home port, and we don't necessarily will be, you know, that's not guaranteed. There are other people who would like that, uh, that job for back office, for science, and for the, and for the maritime job. Think about, one minute, mm -hmm. Bella. Uh, think about Brexit. 
you know, it, London what, it, it will be losing a fair amount of the, uh, the that hub of insurance and, and maritime white collar ma maritime. It'll go other places. It can come to New York if we think aggressively about how to uh, approach that, and then think about growth. I think you you heard it from. Uh, Captain Singh, that's the way to pro uh, Aaron's uh, proper title. Uh, but, uh, and with, you know, uh, with love and respect for our friends at Harvest School, we need to create so many more. And your, your, your thoughts about uh, asking that hard question of DOE, why aren't they doing more for uh, um, CTE programs? Why aren't we investing more to uh, get these good jobs filled by New York kids? Uh, at this school and many, many, many other schools. So, you know, uh, I, I think the Harbor School is a shining example of what can be, but it should be one of many. Uh, and it should be also Fort Hamilton High School, you know, McKee, many, many others can create programs that will feed this industry and, and create good jobs over time. So with that, I'll let you read the full testimony later, but uh, and I always appreciate the opportunity to, to, talk, to you, talk with you in this committee. Thank you. Um, this panel is always very informative and, and talks about the realities um, of what's actually happening on our waterways. Um, and I, how do we get the administration to provide the resources that you need to enhance, to build, and to retain um, maritime industry here and to, and to grow and to grow it. I think uh, what Eric, you know, his, his closing coda about the Waterfront Management Advisory Board, yeah. that, uh, that, well, you know, we, we sigh about that, but that is a great vehicle to push this administration to do the study to find out where the, where the opportunities are, where the gaps are. So let's, let's start with something we have. That's a, that, that could be a, a civic voice for uh, you know, great leaders like Ed and, and Eric and the, the panel you heard before. Um, so I, I, that's where I would advise you as, uh, as, one, as a person, single, really almost single-handedly, along with uh, Congressman Kalis, have tried to revive that entity. So that's, that's one idea. I, I, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, for the record, I want to say that I have been working really hard to, um, to bring the Waterfront Management Advisory Board and, and make it a reality instead of something that we just have um, accomplished on paper. We've made our recommendations for appointments and we are waiting on the administration. We talk to them frequently about the need to do this. Um, the need to recognize how important their function is going to be in terms of looking at our maritime, our marine highway, about the industry. We're talking billions of dollars, and, um, and I have not. I am very frustrated, and I'm saying this on the record because I hope that it helps to move it forward. I am very frustrated with the administration for not recognizing how important it is to activate the water man um, waterfront management advisory board. So um, it's not due to any lack of um, energy from you know the waterfront committee and the chair. Uh, and I, I think that's an excellent point. You thank you. <laughs> Um, any other suggestions? Yeah, uh, thank you, Roland. Yes, the, the Waterfront Management Advisory Board would be uh, a good start. Uh, and I, I also wanted to say that what Roland is saying is absolutely correct. I don't, the New York Shipping Association, I don't believe, tracks all the tug and barge uh, uh, employments uh, here in the harbor as well. So, I mean, I'm sure those numbers are significantly higher uh, for our industry altogether. We do a lot of outreach. Uh, we're very, uh, very happy that the EDC did the Job Awareness Day. That was uh, well received by uh, the, all the schools, and actually there was extra schools that I never even met before. So that was good to have an event like that. The Tug and Barge uh, Committee does an annual Tug and Barge Training Day every year, and we do invite all of our school partners from the Global School of McKee and, 
and a Harvard school to come and interact with the industry, go on board a tug, go on board a barge. Uh, that's a joint training day that we run every year with the Coast Guard, FDNY, and NYPD. So getting that awareness out, I think, is a key component. But yeah, um, starting that waterfront management uh, advisory board uh, up and running again would be a big component of this. Thank you. You know, um, when um, Ed, in fact, um, you didn't identify yourself on the record um, w before you testified. I'm sorry. I'm Edward J. Kelly, the executive director of the Maritime Association of the Port of New York and New Jersey. Thank you. I was you. trying to stay within my time <laughs> allotment. I got started too fast. I, I appreciate that. Um, well, you talked about, you know, training, certification, and licensing. Um, are there sources outside of our DOE structure where um, people could um, get training and, and certified in certain areas? And um, is the cost prohibitive? Is, it, is that maybe a contributing factor to why um, people are not? going into Yes, th th this type of uh, skill set and certification licensing are available from private sources, mm -hmm. but the cost can be rather extensive and it would be a barrier to entry. Uh, you know, there are various trade schools and things uh, mostly uh, are used by current employees where industry will sponsor okay. current employees to advance their certifications and licensing. Uh, you basically you come in at a basic level and then as, as you have on-job time and experience, you can sit for additional testing. And many of the companies will support existing employees. Uh, in some cases, out of desperation, they will have to accept people that look like promising people and try to start from scratch, but they would obviously prefer not to. So if someone does come with the proper certifications, uh, we're also working with uh, the military to the Mariner programs to try uh -huh. to help make that transition from qualified military people to come into the industry as well. But the answer very shortly is yes, there are options, but they are expensive and time right, consuming. Right. And uh, if people are spending money from their own pocket and not working, it's right. very difficult it's, to support a family, pay your rent, et cetera. So it's, it's a huge so barrier yeah, to, it could to, be a challenge. particularly to entering the industry. Are there the scholarships industry. available? From individual industry? Yeah, you know, for people who are not working in the industry but would like to go to a, a facility none, none, none that outside I am a, of None that I am aware of, per se, but, uh, you know, again, it, it's, mm -hmm. I don't know who would pay for that. If, it, you know, we have a constant requirement for skilled, licensed, certified people. Uh, and how does the industry... Um, market these jobs? How, how does the industry get the word out that well, you these mention, jobs you would mention exist? the word, and I, I don't think you said the word, but you mentioned nepotism. And, uh, you know, families, there's a lot of people with the same last names in some of these yes. industries. Yes. And that's because it's an excellent opportunity and that people in that family, if you have an uncle or a cousin or a brother or somebody that's in there making a good living uh, with good benefits, that's able to take care of his family, get upward social mobility, of course, you know about it. So I think the key to that, uh, obviously, there are legal steps and there's been steps of against nepotism, but it's a matter of awareness. And that's why we very much are in support of DOE getting the word out because we are a somewhat invisible uh, industry. As you say, you know, people's eyes open up when we get them out on the water and they can see things that normally they can't. In fact, our industry is by federal law mandated to obscure a lot of what we do for security purposes. So a lot of people don't see what we do, they don't know what we do. And I think we need to find some concerted way for DOE to get into their guidance program that jobs are available, what they are, and to help to guide, make things available or let kids know that these opportunities are out there, and then to put the money into the CTE type of schools that make it possible for them to go there. But how do you go about hiring um, for the various jobs within, you know, the maritime industry um, for people who are out of school, who, you know, have completed their education but are unemployed looking for, you know, um, 
jobs and, and, and sort of a new career path. Mm -hmm. I think that the folks from the Harbor School can speak to that with some of the entry level type of things. Where are they looking? Uh, industry is also looking for entry level people, but we use trade journals. Um, you know, we maybe need to find better ways to interact with some of the CTs. There is an industry advisory panel, and the industry is very closely aligned with places like the Harbor School. We work closely mm -hmm. with McKee. Mm -hmm. We work closely with, uh, you know, Urban Assembly School of Global Commerce. Uh, if the city can provide us more places to, that we should be looking with, uh, you know, I think we can work with those people. Uh, as I said, we've done internships. We've done, you know, on-job training. Mm -hmm. uh, McAllister, one of our tug companies right in Staten Island, donated uh, machinery for the electrical engineering classes. So, you know, we're, industry is certainly willing to work with the school system. But are there unskilled jobs that are on the waterfront that someone could do entry level? And I'm just Joe Blow. Um, I'm unemployed. I would like a job on the waterfront. Um, how would I even find out about, you know, if they were if, if there were jobs open and open or available for people who don't have legacy members or, you know, aren't related in any the way? The industry reaches out to where we know places like the Harbor School or whatever, and we'll reach out to those schools and establish but, uh, but a relationship. I'm, I'm now talking Other about that, someone who's beyond, you know, school age. Um, I'm talking about um, a person who's 21, mm -hmm. who hasn't found a job, is, is healthy, capable, able. Um, are there jobs that, you know, I could go to and start? like entry level and learn and work sort of like on the job? And if so, how would I find out about them? It, that would be the, the last or the second, the second or perhaps the last step of an industry. Uh, they would want to get qualified people, experienced people. If you want to hire a welder, you want somebody that knows how to weld. You don't want somebody that, gee, I'd like to have a job and we'll spend the next number of months or whatever mm -hmm. trying to train on our dime when we will reach out and we will look for the people that have the skills. Uh, if we, we don't want to just pick up a person and hope that maybe so they'll be able to no pass a like Coast Guard exam. There's no unskilled jobs. There, there are some throughout the transportation logistic distribution. There are warehouse positions. There are various things like that, but will that lead to an onboard a water job or specifically to a welding job or perhaps some of the higher echelon jobs that we're here talking about? Probably not. Uh, and again, it, it would still be a job, you know, in, in the industry, not necessarily on the water, but how do people find out about the supply side of, of, of the jobs and, and how to Those become we a use. part of the transportation distribution? You know, things that don't require mm -hmm. um, sort of a mechanical skill set. The point is we use where we think we're going to find people, and that would be in trade magazines. It would be in uh, trade circulars. We reach out to certain, uh, the unions reach out through various channels. So, you know, the, the big problem is a lot of people don't know that we have these jobs, and they don't know where to look for them. Uh, we obviously, we've got several hundred thousand people in our industry right now. We've all been able to hire them, reach out, train them, and, uh, you know, it works. But I think we would like, what we're saying is we would like to have more of a diverse, localized workforce uh, that's properly trained, certified, et cetera, that we can recruit. And, and the industry is willing to work with the local communities to try to set that up. Okay, thank you. Um, Eric? I just want to add one thing in there, and, and um, in regard to the entry-level positions on waterfront, uh, it requires a lot of uh, credentials. You'll need to get your, you know, transportation worker identification credential, your merchant mariner credential. Uh, we worked uh, previously with the Virginia's House of Hope and is serving the underserved to try to provide them with uh, entry-level positions. Uh, it didn't go as well as we were hoping, uh, you know, because of the fact that they just weren't prepared for that type of a of a lifestyle. But uh, it wasn't for the lack of trying. Uh, you know, at, uh, there's different types of levels of training. There's some where you can just take a training on any course, and then there's certified training. Like I know at the Maritime College and all of the Maritime schools, uh, the colleges at least, you all have to be approved by the National Maritime Center. You go through a long process. 
it's, it's a very specialized and uh, unique training that has to be certified in order for them to go to the next level. So that creates some issues too as well. And that's why we try to work with the, the area high schools to pre best prepare them for that type of, uh, uh, you might want to say, uh, progress. Okay. Thank you all very much um, for testifying. Our next panel will be Captain Jonathan Bolaware, South Street Seaport Museum, Lou Pernice, the ILA, Local 1814, Peter Malinowski, the Billion Oyster Project, and Stephanie Obra, or Dobra, Doba, from Sierra Club. This is it. Um, yes, could you um, um, identify yourself and your organization? And we really have to keep it to three minutes. So um, we have another committee hearing uh, coming in on our heels. So you may begin. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for convening this event and also for your leadership of a committee that is uh, challenging in the sense that New York waterfront is extensive, has a lot of history, uh, and in fact it is the reason why New York is what it is. Uh, and, and I won't go into a history with you, but I will say, first of all, John from Bulware, South Street Seaport Museum. Uh, I'm the executive director, and I am a mariner also by fact. I spent 20 years in sailing ships, educating students on the water, and many of those people went on to professional careers as well. And now I'm in a role where I oversee a group of people who do that very same thing. So we are part so the city in which we operate was a port before it was a city, and indeed the location of the financial capital of the world is no accident. Wall Street is where it is because South Street was where it was. Fifty years ago, our museum was founded to preserve that history, but also to activate it for the future, and it is that latter role that excites me the most. Uh, in that respect, over the past 50 years, I want to name four things that we have done, uh, both in terms of our achievements, but also to pave the way for how we participate in this very issue to our mission going forward. Uh, first, in the 1970s, we opened the Pioneer Marine School, which is a trade school specifically targeted at a, at a 40 year, year old version of the same matter that we're talking about now, which is how to get people into the maritime workforce. This is not a new topic, it's not a new problem. Uh, it is one that we can confront. The Pioneer Marine School still has active participants working in marine trade jobs around the country. We were also a founding partner of the New York Harbor School, which began later in Brooklyn, but first in classrooms in uh, the South Street Seaport Museum. And indeed, the impressive Captain Singh, who we heard from this morning, got his start in Sea Scouts and at the South Street Seaport Museum. Uh, we're also a guild of sorts. We, we grow our own in, in the sense that we need mariners. We employ them in our education vessels. We employ them in the care of our historic ships. We employ them in our education programs. But frequently, we suffer from some of the same problems that other industry employers do, and that is that there is an insufficient supply of qualified mariners. So we frequently end up bringing people in in much the way you were just querying, uh, which is we bring people in at an entry level, we spend time on them, and they grow through what in the maritime trade is called the hawse pipe, which is literally the chain through which the anchor passes, right? So it's how you attach the ship to the bottom, but to climb up the hawse pipe is to advance progressively to the rank, to start at the deck end, to become a mate, so in that respect, we grow our own, much like a trade guild. Is. And finally, we're an employer. Uh, right now, we employ captains, we employ mates, we employ deckhands, and many of them have a role in which they are teaching others and exposing, in particular, New York City high school students uh, and elementary school students to the maritime trades through our program. So I want to take just a moment and talk about these jobs, and just to say, I have four seconds, but um, these jobs are not uniquely maritime. I want to make this one point. That there's an overlap between here uh, serving the goal that we're talking about. But I would, I would be curious. You heard from New York Harbor School about how many of their percentages of kids are still in the maritime trade. But I would wonder, where else are they? And I bet those numbers are considerably higher as well. A shipwright can build a house, but a house builder <laughs> cannot build a ship. A maritime welder can build a skyscraper, but the reverse is not true. 
A boat carpenter can build a violin, but a luthier cannot build a boat. So these are some of the most potent trade uh, educations that exist in the world. Um, so, and, and the last thing I want to say is all of what we're talking about is relevant to the city going forward. We were the busiest port in the world for 100 years. We are no longer, but we are still a vital port. And the port operations represented by this impressive body here is the circulatory system of the greatest city in the world. Well done. Well said. I am, uh, first let me introduce myself and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about some of the problems we have in the maritime industry. I am <coughs> Lou Pernice. I'm president of Local 1814 out of Brooklyn. We represent more than a thousand deep sea longshoremen, along with uh, in Brooklyn, along with the maintenance and repair in Brooklyn and Staten Island. There are many issues that come up before us, especially when it deals with how do we fill our ranks and some of the questions that were raised by you from uh, the conversation dealing with the previous speakers, just to give you an idea of what we have done at the Brooklyn area about 10 or 12 years ago when we opened up our books for new applicants coming into the industry. A lot of it was, of course, father and son, and it still is. That has been restricted in many areas but it was father and son. Like me and like many of my officers, they are also in the industry because of their relatives. But what we did in Brooklyn, when the opportunity came for openings in the Brooklyn waterfront and later on in Staten Island, we went to the local community boards. We spoke to the representatives at the community boards, giving them what we'd like to do and what we needed for our industry, because first what we were interested in was hiring people from the local community. And that was very important to us. And it's only because as how it existed in the past. In the past, when I came into the industry back in 1961, the majority of our longshoremen in Brooklyn, which exceeded 10,000, they were in walking distance to work. Then things changed. When things got very good, the industry got good, also for the blue collar workers, they moved out. And now the, in, the neighborhoods are not affiliated with our industry. But in addition to that, the other problem, and I've heard it time and time again, in the MNR, that's maintenance and repair, we don't get the qualified people we need. And one of the issues I keep talking about was when I was in high school, you were offered a vocational course, a commercial course, or an academic course if you were to go to college. Most kids today are going to college with no vocational skills. To give you an idea, as was said with the harbor schools, there are, cert there are certain skills that are required, and we don't get them. We don't get them that quickly because the vocational skills that were offered in high schools are no longer there. And I can understand that those skills disappeared once we stopped manufacturing. But now it's coming, and we need it. We can't get it. We cannot get the people into our industry pre-qualified. So the industry itself has set up training programs. Once they get into the industry, they have the opportunity to train within the industry. Now that in itself creates another problem. But the problem is, where do we get these qualified people like we used to get from high school? They're no longer around. Say again? Could you wrap up? Could you finish your testimony? 
Are you finished, or do you need to have to say if she wants to No, 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 no. I, I, I mean, some of the things we're facing, some of the things we are facing, to get into our industry, you have to be pre-qualified. They go through a screening of both management and union people before they're accepted for the next phase. They go for a drug test, and then they go for a physical. And then the last test is the Waterfront Commission. We are regulated by an agency both in New York and New Jersey called the Waterfront Commission. They are the ones that do a screen background test on the individuals, and they're the ones making a decision as to whether or not the individual is qualified based on his background to work in the industry. That in itself is another piece of legislation that we can discuss at another time that's preventing us from getting the qualified people that we need. I'm done now. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and we will have an offline conversation. Um, I have your card, and we'll, have, we'll make um, arrangements to have a meeting, okay? Yes? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak about these important issues. My name is Stephanie Doba. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Sierra Club. Uh, the Sierra Club has more than 3 million members and supporters nationwide and over 80,000 members and supporters in New York State. I'm going to echo the remarks of many other uh, individuals today about the importance of offshore wind, talk a little bit about where we're at with offshore wind, what it means for workforce development, and what we'd like your committee to do to help it. Uh, first of all, offshore wind is literally on the horizon. As you may know, the first offshore wind facility in the uh, country opened uh, last year in Rhode Island, and, uh, and development is underway for de generating 2.4 gigawatts of offshore wind off New York's coastline. We're expecting the offshore wind master plan to be released soon, which will help lay the groundwork for that to happen. Offshore wind has a tremendous potential for workforce development, as many people have spoken about. The skills uh, that need to be taught can be done in CTE schools. Our partners in CUNY and SUNY are already working toward those goals. And these are hugely, uh, these jobs are huge in, hugely in demand. Wind farm technician is, I think, the largest, the fastest growing job category in the United States today. So. We have uh, great faith in the Sierra Club in our partnerships with the region's unions and um, other organizations that recognize the importance of these well-paying, highly skilled jobs to the future of New York City. It's literally, it's survival in the face of climate change. We need to invest in renewable energy and the workers who will bring it to our shores. Uh, finally, what can the City Council do? What can the committee do? Uh, we ask you to work with Mayor de Blasio to move forward on the citywide request for a proposal to power the city's government operations with renewable energy. As you know, there, the city has a commitment to slash carbon emissions sector-wide 80% by 2050 and has committed to sourcing 100% of its own government operations from renewables by 2030. Offshore wind must be a, play a part in this solicitation, and the city has a role to play, as does the council, to support the investment in and rapid deployment of offshore wind to power our city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Um, I, I want to thank the administration for staying. Um, I, I appreciate uh, you helping us power forward our, our efforts to get the, the WMAB, the Waterfront Management Advisory Board, you know, up functioning so that we can handle and deal with the issues that are so important and especially and, and that's enhancing and growing um, our harbor and the potential that it has for our economic um, growth I, I want to thank the harbor school um, and CUNY for being here uh, the harbor school for all that they're doing to prepare young people um, to be a part of our waterfront industries I want to thank all of our advocates 
for um, being strong, um, being prepared, and making sure that we move this agenda forward. I want to thank all of you for being here today and taking your time. And so uh, with that, this meeting is now adjourned. So we're in the process of previous. Uh,